It happens every 43.8 seconds. I'm talking about car theft in the USA. Yep, every minute someone loses their precious vehicle to crooks. If you want to learn more about these heartbreaking stats, here you go. Over 800,000 car thefts were reported in the US in 2020 alone, and Ford pickups win the award for the crook's choice, since it was the one most frequently stolen. Also, New Year's Day had the most thefts. Seems like we all need to keep an eye out for our cars. First things first, it's very unlikely that someone may steal your car while you're on the move. But once you park it, it gets way easier. So you need to park responsibly. Yeah, sometimes you might need to walk a bit more, but it's worth it if it means leaving your car in a well-lit place. Improperly parked cars are often taken away by tow trucks. Turns out, not all of them are real. So should you ever see one near your car, check whether it's real or fake. A real tow truck should at least have some branding on it, and its crew should be wearing a uniform. Remember I told you it's not that easy to steal your car while you're on the move? Sorry, but that's only partially true. Carjackers don't really care about the fact that you're sitting in your car. The trick here is simple. Even if you're inside your vehicle, always make sure to lock your doors. Carjackers often have shady schemes of how to lure car owners out of their vehicles. They may even set up a trap and sort of stage a car accident. So even if you see that your car has been bumped from behind, don't rush out of it instantly to check on it. Just wait a little bit to pull over. Make sure the place where you stop is safe and there are people around you. In case you get suspicious, it's better to call the police. If you're ready to shell out some money to protect your car, here's some info. You can install a remote car starter. It's not just a great thing for those who live in colder climates and who need to start their car beforehand. Its main advantage is that you can't drive away with a car started like this, since this mode doesn't allow you to shift gears. Any car has a vehicle identification number, or simply VIN. This one may seem pointless, but here's a trick. When thieves sell a stolen car, they do VIN switching. It's when they want to disguise a stolen vehicle and use another VIN from a similar car. But if you etch your VIN on each window of your vehicle, crooks will instantly see that you're interested in protecting your car. Plus, such a vehicle will seem spoiled for them. After all, they'd have to do the VIN switching, plus they'd have to come up with a plan on how to fix the windows as they have the VIN etched on them. They'll probably need to change the windows altogether, and that's pricey. So reselling such a car would appear too time-consuming for crooks, and they aren't willing to put in that much effort. Come on, these guys don't even work. They're way too lazy to deal with those windows. By the way, some specialists can do this etching for you, so you don't have to deal with it yourself. By the way, if you want to buy a used car, a VIN can help you a lot. Some cars are sort of cloned, which means their VIN isn't real, but was simply added to the plate manually. So you have to check all the documentation before buying a used car. Pay special attention to the DVLA V5 documents and make sure that the VIN there coincides with the VIN on the vehicle. Here's another protection gadget. It's called a smart car alarm and its sound is even nastier than the sound of an alarm clock. It can do two things. First, it makes a super loud sound that can both scare away intruders and attract witnesses. Second, it can send you an alert in case you somehow don't hear the deafening sound it makes. There's another secret mechanism that can protect your car. You can install an emergency stop button that you can wire to the ignition, battery, fuel line, you name it. When you get out of the car, you simply need to flip the switch. Even if crooks steal your keys somehow, it won't help them. They need to find the switch to start the car first, and it's up to you where to hide that switch. We all know that the more security you have in your car, the better. Crooks don't like to mess with technologies, and the statistics prove it. Tesla, along with other high-tech cars, were the least stolen ones over the last few years. However, Modern doesn't mean safe and crook-proof. Many cool vehicles have engine management diagnostic ports. Sounds super convenient, but there's a downside. 
These ports can help unlock and even start the vehicle. So if your car has such a feature, consider getting a lockable cover. Always check whether you've closed the windows before leaving your car. Even the smallest gap is enough for a crook to open the door and steal the car. Yeah, don't tell me it's obvious. I somehow see cars with open windows every single day. If a crook really wants to, they can simply smash a window with a heavy object or even a rock. See what I'm driving at? Try not to make crooks want to open your car. That means there shouldn't be any valuables visible. So please, no laptops or purses on the front seat. Hide them in the trunk or take them with you. There are many options. Just don't show thieves that there's something they can steal from your car. Keeping a spare key in the glove box isn't the best idea either. Crooks know where to look for it. It's really simple. They've opened the car, which isn't that complicated, and they just open up the glove box and they're free to drive. So let's say you still keep your valuables in the car and a spare key in the glove box because, you know, you like it that way. Well, consider installing a steering wheel lock. It's probably not that functional, but experts believe it's a working visual deterrent. Remember how thieves are sort of lazy and don't want to mess with various gadgets? Specialists claim that crooks are more likely to pass by a car that has a steering wheel lock on it. So even if a crook still wants to drive your car away, they won't be able to. Plus, it's not that easy to remove it. Now for the most obvious tip, it's CCTV. There's a variety of such cameras today. They have night vision modes, people detection functions, and really high resolution. Literally anything you might need. A real camera can help you watch your car 24-7. But in case you don't feel like spending money on that, you can install a dummy and hope that the thieves won't figure it out. Okay, let's imagine the worst. Someone ignored all of these simple tips and got their car stolen. What should they do? First, they need to provide all the information to the police. So make sure you know the color. I know, it's easy. But please don't use complicated wording while describing the car color. Like, it's not moss, but rather dark green. You also need to know the year, make, and model. Make sure you remember all these. The police will also need to know your license plate number and VIN. If you don't remember the VIN by heart, write a note on your phone just in case. So you decided to buy a famous brand garment from a reseller. The price is real good, but something just feels off about it. Check out this stitching. It's one of the less obvious but key giveaways of a fake. It will be straight, neat, and tightly packed on authentic items. All stitches will be made of threads of the same color. Fake ones will have less stitching, as it means fewer costs on production materials. The lines won't be that straight either. Carefully study the logo. On imitations, it's often out of proportion compared to the real thing. The angle and slope might be different, so you'd better check what it should really look like on the official website. Many high-end brands stamp logos directly onto their products or have metal or leather ones. On real designer items, the logo is always perfect, with no details missing from the company name and no spelling mistakes. There won't be any errors in anything written on the garment whatsoever, not just the logo. The fabric of authentic items won't have any pulls or rips in it. It won't fade or bleed. If the item is supposed to be made of leather, it should feel weighed. If it's made of cotton, try squeezing some fabric in your fist for a few seconds. If it looks like crumpled paper, the manufacturers most likely treated it with a special agent to keep its shape. It will look terrible after the first wash. Take a stretchy part of a dress or a skirt, tug at it, and then let it go. A quality item won't lose its shape after it. Fabric patterns will always match on real items, and zippers will be covered with a strap. These ones are the most reliable and long-lasting, unlike open plastic zippers that often break. All zippers on dresses, skirts, and any other type of clothing should be of the same length and color. Buttons must be secured with no thread sticking out. The buttonholes should be neatly overlocked and evenly cut through. Gently pull the seams apart 
If you see some gaps, it's definitely not a high quality garment. If the coloring on the handles, straps, or fastening looks faded or leaves marks on the folds, that's another sign of a low quality item genuine brands would never manufacture. Designer items can't come in low quality packaging. Your prospective high end purchases will be packed in branded cloth drawstring bags with branded tissue paper. If you're shopping online and the seller won't send you close up images of details to check, they probably have something to hide. Manufacturers of counterfeit jeans mostly care about recreating their outside and try to produce them as cheaply as possible. They use poor quality materials, so their jeans will feel lighter and thinner. They might also have strange coloring or dye runs. A real inside label for the size and style of jeans should have small stitches close to each other. This micro stitching is a security device that makes the production process more expensive. A fake label will have longer and wider spaced stitching that won't look that neat. Zippers and their tags are rarely stamped on imitations, and so they look generic. The same is with rivets. The ones on real jeans should carry the logo or manufacturer name. The inside seams are made shorter to save on textile costs. Designer jeans lookalikes will have the cheapest cardboard used for their branding patches on the back and fewer cloth tags than the real thing. A leather patch on the back of genuine jeans won't fade or wither. You can only check this after you've washed them several times, though, or if you're buying a secondhand pair. The first thing to check out when shopping for brand sneakers is the box. It shouldn't be damaged. Real sneakers won't have any visible glue stains on the sides. The font on the lettering on the insole should match the size of the shoe and can look unnaturally spaced out and bigger on a faux pair. The size tag is always attached to the bottom of the insole and shouldn't be off centered. The finishing on the real pair heel tab won't be sloppy. The name of the brand on the back of the shoe has to be perfectly centered. All the letters will be of the same sizing and height. Genuine leather on authentic pairs will feel softer and more comfortable on your foot. They use good quality rubber in authentic pairs, so the midsoles won't start to oxidize and change their color. Sneakers by famous brands will be perfectly symmetrical in every way. You can recognize some designer boots by a certain eyelet shape and a number or the contrasting or matching color of stitches. Those have to be parallel to each other and look professionally done. When shopping for a designer bag, take a close look at the logo. Check its size and see if the plates are clear and have the correct spelling. Interior labels will tell you the manufacturing nation. If it says France or Italy, you have a lower chance of getting a knockoff. Designers mostly add authenticity cards to their bags and mark their items with various serial numbers. Do your research online to find out what the real one should look like for your specific bag. They don't imprint their name on every model, so check if yours is supposed to have it. High end items hardly ever go on sale. Even if that happens, it's never a clearance price, so don't fall for it. If your dream bag is supposed to be made of genuine leather, make sure it feels and smells like it. If it's super smooth and even, then it's likely a fake. Real leather has a slightly uneven texture, and the real thing can't have a glossy finish. That's another giveaway of an imitation. Count the pockets and make sure they're correctly placed. Fake bags are often recreated from photos, so the lining color might be of the wrong one. It must be exactly of the same color as the bag. The hardware should feel solid and shouldn't chip. The stitching should be perfectly even. Designers will never leave loose threads or back and forth stitching at the end of a seam that makes production cheaper. A high end watch made of top quality materials can't be too light. An authentic watch will always have better movement than a counterfeit one. The mechanism will be smooth, and you won't hear a loud ticking sound, unlike in a fake. A bad smell, uneven coloring, scratches, and abrasions on the wristband are some more signs of a fake product both for high-end and medium-priced popular brands. Check out the back cover of your prospective new accessory. It should contain basic information like the logo with the brand name on it without spelling errors, a watch case material, 
it's usually steel, and information about the clockworks mechanism manufacturing country, the engravings will be sharp and clear. Authentic designer glasses will always have the designer logo, manufacturer information, and a barcode or serial code on the retail box. They come in high-quality cases with distinct lettering and even spacing. You can do some research online and find out what your dream pair should be packed like. The lenses on designer shades are always made of superior quality materials and in most cases have a brand name or initials etched on them. If you can scratch the logo and it easily comes off, it's a fake. The real pair with plastic framing can't be too light and the ones made of stainless steel won't be too heavy. When you try moving the hinges, they won't feel too tight or too floppy. They will be attached using quality molding and screws. When shopping for a cashmere scarf, hold it against light and study the weave. If it looks uneven and irregular, it's more likely to be pure and handcrafted. Only machines can create perfect regular patterns. If it's glowing too much, there is most definitely an amalgam or foreign fiber added to it. Try wearing it around your neck. The real thing will feel soft, smooth, and delicate. As authentic pashmina is hypoallergenic, it also feels warm when you hold it. If you already have a cashmere scarf and doubt its authenticity, check it for bobbles. The real thing will get them over time, just like any other natural fiber. If yours doesn't, it probably has nylon or silk in it. Authentic perfumes have a thick cellophane wrapping sealed in the most careful way to adhere to the box tightly. You won't see wide, uneven seams or excess glue on it. They make real packaging for perfumes from high-quality white paperboard. Check the manufacturer's website and compare the information given there to that on the packaging label. Any mismatch is a sign you're looking at a counterfeit item. Famous brands don't use a lot of dye in their products, so the authentic perfume is usually pale. It always comes in high-quality bottles with a smooth and fine surface, unlike the imitations that are a bit rough and contoured. Now, if you're falling from a great height, try to copy a skydiver's position. Your head and chest should face down. Spread your arms and legs and bend them at a 90-degree angle. If possible, choose a place to land. Bushes or haystacks can cushion your fall. Water surface is only safe if you fall from a height of no more than 150 feet. Before landing, try to position your body vertically. Remember that it's always better to fall forward than backward. Protect your head and neck with your arms locked together. Actually, none of this will save you, but it will give you something to do before they name the crater after you. Now, if you're plummeting from a cliff, do your best to break your fall down into several parts. The shorter they are, the better. Each of these parts will absorb some impact of the fall. This way you'll have much higher chances of surviving. Try to grab onto a sturdy object, like a bush or a rock on your way to the bottom. It'll slow you down. If you see a piece of wood or a plank, snatch it too. It might help to soften your fall when you hit the ground. Most importantly, don't hold your body stiff. This is likely to harm your internal organs. Cover your head and try to land on your feet with your knees slightly bent. In fact, once you hit, everything about you will be slightly bent. But hey, you gotta try! If a building you are in collapsed and you ended up under a pile of debris and rubble, try to keep your panic at bay. Yeah! Your main task now is to protect your breathing organs and make your air supply last as long as possible. If there's enough space, take off your shirt or t-shirt and tie its bottom in a knot. Then put it back on your head through the neck hole so that the knot is on top of your head. You'll get a makeshift hood that will protect your face from dust, sand, and debris. It will also provide you with a bit of oxygen while you're trying to get back to the surface. If you're stuck in a falling elevator, lie down on your back and try to occupy as much space as possible. Your body fat and muscles are compressible. They'll absorb some of the impact force. If you can't lie down, sit on the floor. It's still better than standing. Your backside will act like an airbag in a car. But whatever position you choose, cover your head. The best way to do it is to put one arm in front of your face and the other on the back of your neck. If you get stuck in the wilderness, first of all, find some water. Check low-lying areas. If there are mountains, look for water at the foot of the cliffs. 
If you manage to find some rainwater, don't let it stay in the container too long. It may go bad. Pay attention to ants climbing trees. They're likely to be traveling toward a source of moisture inside a tree. A bottle of water can help you start a fire if you keep it under direct sunlight long enough. The bottle will act as a lens, gathering all the heat in one spot. Use fire and smoke to signal for help. Cover the flames with a big branch or with a pan for 3-4 to four seconds. This will gather enough smoke. Then let this puff of smoke go. Now, if you've fallen through the ice, try to get back to its edge. Don't pull yourself out by grabbing it. The edge will keep breaking, and this will wear you down in no time. Kick your legs until your body is positioned horizontally in the water. After that, get out of the water and onto the ice. Once you've made it there, don't stand up. Your weight should be distributed over a larger area. Then the ice will be less likely to break. Start rolling toward the shore like seals do. If you have a muscle cramp while swimming, try to turn on your back and float this way. Massage the bottom of your foot or the part of your leg that feels tight. If you have a cramp in the back of your leg, bend it at the knee and pull it toward your chest. You should be still floating on your back. Try to relieve the cramp by pulling your toes inward. If you get caught in an indoor fire, stay low and crawl toward the nearest exit. The smoke usually rises toward the ceiling. That's why crouching might keep you from inhaling it. If you have a piece of cloth or a handkerchief, put it against your mouth. It'll act like a filter against the smoke. Fall to the ground and roll back and forth if your clothes have caught fire. If you do have a fire extinguisher, aim it at the base of the flames. It's much more effective. And keep in mind that if you break a window, you'll let in more oxygen, and this will feed the fire. And here's what you should do to stay safe during a natural disaster. If you see the area getting flooded while you're outside, run away from any streams, storm drains, or rivers. Try to get to higher ground. If you're stuck at home, move to the roof if you think it's safe enough. If a tornado is moving towards you and you don't have time to escape, find a ditch or some low place. Lie down and cover your head with your hands or clothes. If a tornado happens while you're inside and there's no basement in your house, hide in a bathtub. Use a pillow to protect your head from any kind of debris that may fall down. The plumbing in the bathroom walls adds structural strength to the place. But if your bathroom has windows or an exterior-facing wall, pick a more secure place, for example, a closet. The more walls separate you from the tornado, the better. If you're outside during a storm and you suddenly feel your hair stand on end, it's your cue lightning is about to strike. Your skin might start tingling and you're likely to hear some clicking or buzzing sounds. Immediately crouch down and place your head between your knees. But even though you should be as low as possible, do not lie down. The only thing touching the ground should be the balls of your feet. Keep your heels together. This way, instead of running through your entire body, electricity is likely to go in one foot and out the other. You can also cover your ears with your hands to prevent hearing loss. If you're lost in the desert, travel during the early morning hours. This way, you'll be able to avoid most of the heat. If you see a hill or some other high ground, climb it and look around. You might spot some greenery, buildings, or a road. You won't have such an opportunity at night. Many desert animals also hunt after the sunset. And here's how you should act around wild animals. If a bull is charging at you, stand still until it comes close. Then throw a piece of clothing in the opposite direction. Bulls react to movements. And throwing a hat or a shirt away from you will distract the animal. It'll chase the moving object. If a shark is moving towards you, don't swim away in panic. You'll look like something the animal will want to eat. Wait until the shark gets closer and start hitting it with your fists. Aim at its eyes, nose, and gills. These are the only vulnerable areas on the animal's body. If you meet a pack of unfriendly dogs, distract them and move away quietly. If one of the dogs still lunges at you, place some object between yourself and the animal's jaws. Now, let's say you've accidentally disturbed a swarm of bees, and now they are coming after you. Run in a straight line as fast as possible until they stop chasing you. An even better alternative is to find some shelter. It can be your car, a house, or even a public bathroom and hide inside. Now, if you accidentally meet a bear, introduce yourself. No, wait. 
Actually, everything will depend on what species it is. If it's a larger brown bear, fall down and pretend you've passed away. Shouldn't be hard. But if it's a smaller black bear, which rarely attacks people, shouting and making yourself look bigger may help. You may also try to scare the bear away by pretending to lunge at it. If you encounter a snake, try to be as quiet as possible. If there's an opportunity to walk away, go for it. But if you can't avoid the reptile, raising your voice, banging two sticks together, or stomping your feet might make it retreat. Even though snakes don't have visible ears, they're sensitive to vibrations. And if all of these things happen to you on the same day, call the Guinness people. I think you've set some records. You're running through a dark alley looking for that new cafe your friends are waiting at. You can hear all sorts of scary, mysterious sounds. Ouch! What was that? Some monster just jumped right into your head. You sprint for a few more seconds, finally reach your destination, and everyone starts laughing at you. You yell at them to call 911, but then you see in the mirror, there's a cat sitting on your head. In case of real emergencies, you can rely on your iPhone to help you out if you activate Emergency SOS. It will turn on a loud siren to let everyone around know you're in trouble or scare away the bad guys. It automatically calls the emergency services in your area to send help your way. And if you decide to turn that feature on, it can also send an automated text message to a contact you choose. To activate that emergency SOS, you have to hold down the lock button and one of your volume buttons together for 5 seconds. You can also enable activation by clicking the screen lock button 5 times in a row in Settings, Emergency SOS, Call with Side button. To use this feature to the fullest, you can assign your emergency contacts. Go to Health app, click on your profile picture, and select Medical ID in the menu that opens next. Tap Edit, scroll down to Emergency Contacts, and tap the Add button. Now you can select one or several people and specify their relationship to you. When you're ready, don't forget to tap Done to save all the changes. Now, in case of trouble, your iPhone will text your emergency contacts your current location and let them know you've activated the SOS. If you're moving, they'll be updated on your final destination. You can also fill in all the medical data in case you're unconscious and should need first responders' help. If you have an Android, you can activate emergency mode by holding up the power key and tapping emergency mode when the power menu opens up. You can also quickly tap the power button three times in a row. You'll have to tap the box to agree to emergency mode terms and conditions, of course, and then tap turn on. If your Android phone doesn't have a power key, you'll have to swipe down on the screen to open quick settings and tap the power icon and emergency mode. The screen will go dark, and apps will be limited to help you save battery. It'll let you use the flashlight, sound loud alarms, send your location, and of course, make emergency calls. You can call from the lock screen. Just swipe up and tap emergency call to dial the number. You'll see your registered emergency contacts at the top of the screen. You can assign up to four of such contacts in Settings, About Phone, Emergency Information. The exact location can differ from phone to phone. It also helps if you fill in all your medical information in this section. If you ever have to use the SOS feature, your phone will take pictures with your front and rear cameras and record ambient audio. This data will be sent to all of your emergency contacts together with your precise location and a message saying, I need help. If your Android doesn't have service or works without a SIM card, it'll still let you call 911, picking up the signal from another carrier. When you don't need emergency mode anymore, you can tap three vertical dots to open more options and choose to turn it off. If you want to know exactly how strong your signal is, turn off Wi-Fi and call this. It will launch the field test tool. On older iOS, it shows you a number like in the top left-hand corner of the screen. If you have a newer iOS, it opens up the main menu with device info. Tap LTE and then Serving Cell Mez. The RSRP0 and RSPR1 are your cellular signal strength in numbers. They're more accurate than bars and always negative. The closer the number is to minus 50, the better. Minus 130 is the worst you can have. On an Android, you can find it out in Settings, More Options, or More Settings. Open About Phone, move to Mobile Networks, then tap Signal Strength. If it's not there, try Network Type or SIM Status. 
Never turn your phone off in an emergency, even if you're low on battery. If you keep it on, it'll let the emergency services contact you and find you using GPS services. If you don't want to switch to emergency mode for some reason, but want to keep your battery alive for longer, turn down screen brightness and set your screen to turn off after the shortest possible time. Turn off vibration, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and data roaming, and don't run any apps except for emergency ones. Don't start shutting down background apps one by one, though. Doing it eats more battery than letting them run loose. If you went out with your friends or colleagues and have to go through an unsafe area, you can track everyone's location on WhatsApp using the Live Location feature. First, you need to give the app permission to see your location in Settings, Apps and Notifications, Advanced, App Permissions, Location, Turn On WhatsApp. Whew! It can differ phone to phone, but should work. Then open the chat and tap Attach. Choose Location and Share Live Location. Here, you can select how long to share it with the participants of an individual or a group chat. Tap Send. You can stop sharing it at any time. You can also share your location in real time or request the whereabouts of your loved ones via Google Trusted Contacts app. If you don't respond to their request for a while when they know you're in transit, it automatically sends them your location. Download offline maps when traveling or going to some new place in your own city. They can help you out in case you're in an unfamiliar area and have poor or no signal at all. Use a password instead of a 4-digit or 6-digit passcode on your phone. You can switch to it in Settings, Touch ID or Face ID in Passcode, Change Passcode. Enter your old passcode, then tip Passcode Options and Custom Alphanumeric Code. Make it a mix of uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. Choose a fingerprint over facial recognition. It's possible to fool your phone with a high-quality photo of you to unlock it. Fingerprints aren't that easy to recreate. If you're going through an unsafe area, you can choose to disable biometrics for a while. Go to Settings, Touch ID or Face ID in Passcode, and turn off Touch ID or Face ID. Once you're safe again, you can log your fingerprint or face back into the system. On an Android, you can enable lockdown mode. It lets you instantly disable fingerprint authentication and hides notifications on the lock screen to protect your data. You or someone else who gets hold of your phone will only be able to unlock it by entering the password or PIN. To activate lockdown mode, open Settings, scroll all the way to Security and Location, and there, tap Lock Screen Preferences. Choose to enable Show Lockdown option. Then, you'll just have to press and hold the power button to put your phone in that mode. To help your iPhone recognize you faster in any weather conditions, you can add an alternative appearance for Face ID. Put on your winter hat or glasses, cover your face with a scarf, and open Settings, Face ID, and Passcode. Set up an alternative appearance. It works for iOS 12 and later versions. Stock up on emergency apps available for both iPhones and Androids. They can give you instructions on what to do before, during, and after a natural disaster and even claim your insurance later. Some do it in the form of trivia questions to help you remember. There's an earthquake app that tracks the phones of its users to measure the distance and define the locations where the natural disaster is the most severe. Hopefully not where you are. You step out the front door and get in the car. No way around it. There's a chore to be done, and it's not going to be enjoyable. You need groceries. You only needed toilet paper and some oranges, but somehow, you left the store with four bags of groceries. It happens. Just got to put them in the trunk. Oh, wait, it's full. There's a bunch of old stuff in there that you were going to donate. You're not going to dump your groceries in the back seat either. They might tip over. Here's the solution. Grab yourself a couple of snap hooks, take your headrest, and bring it up just a bit. Now you have space to place the hooks on those metal bits. Now just open the hooks and hang up your bags. Perfect! Oh, you like that? Good, here's some more knowledge for you to make your life as a driver a bit easier. We've all felt those nasty hot sunny days. Days when you always wish you had a drink in your hand. Well, today is one of those days. At the store, you bought a Coke, the kind you need a bottle opener for. The only problem is, you don't have one. Don't fret, 
You see these metal things on the seatbelt? They keep you safe, but they're also the exact shape of a bottle opener. Easy. Still got some old DVD cases lying around? Dust one off and get ready to make a sweet car stereo cover. Here's what you do. Grab a pair of scissors and cut off the edges. The idea is to create a flat, almost paper-like cover. The rest is easy. You go down to your car with your new do-it-yourself cover, cut off any extra bits, and place it under the stereo system so it doesn't fall out. Then, all you need to do is close it. Keeps it nice and clean. Plus, no one will get any bad ideas. You're out for a drive, but you left your phone holder at home. Ugh, nuts. Maybe you need a little GPS. Maybe you need to make some calls or record your latest Watch Me Drive Around vlog. So you need to improvise a little. Reach under the seat and pull out some elastic bands. You're obviously not using them for anything. None down there? Check the glove box. Bingo! Next, wrap one or two bands tightly around the air vent. Then shove your phone in the middle. If you do it right, you'll have a do-it-yourself phone holder for when you're in a pinch. If you do it wrong, well, hello modern art. If you've just got your driver's license or even a new car and you're not quite familiar with the feel of it yet, there's a simple trick you can use to get the hang of your new wheels. Take a plastic bottle and place it in front of your car. Then just drive over the bottle a couple of times, forward and backwards. This will help you get a feel for exactly where the wheels are and how big the front of your car is. Okay, so you feel like you've got a hidden artsy side, but you're afraid that you've got no talent. What you need is the perfect art partner, your car. Take a couple of tiny paint bottles and place them in a row right there on your driveway. Then prop up a blank canvas right in front of them. You can use a huge piece of cardboard, a stretched out bed sheet, or some nice blank paper. Now, here's the fun part. Get back in the car, start the engine, and drive over them. They'll splash paint all over the canvas and create unique and abstract art. Congratulations, you're officially an artist. When you're driving cross country, your biggest enemy might be your eyelids. They keep drooping down. If this is you, next time you go on a road trip, pack an air mattress. Feeling a bit drowsy on the road? Pull over somewhere safe Set up your air mattress in the back seat and take a power nap. You'll wake up feeling good as new, ready to hit the road again. You can even just leave the mattress back there, ready for when you want to rest your head again. If you're traveling with a buddy, they might feel sleepy during the long trip too. This one's a bit easier. Get your car one of those fluffy seat belt covers. Your co-pilot can just tilt their head to the side and take a nap. Let's just hope they don't snore. Your mirrors might be too small to show you exactly what you need to see on the road. Those blind spots can be annoying, and you can end up with a sore neck from all that twisting around every time you change lanes. With a new and improved 180-degree mirror, you won't have to keep doing your best owl impression. Picture this. You've now got four people in the car. Your buddy next to you, sleeping on that awesome seatbelt cover you installed, and two other friends bored out of their minds in the back seat, playing with their phones. Before the trip, because you're a good host, you charge up your tablet so that they can watch a movie or something. But who's going to want to hold the tablet up for two whole hours? Just use one of these ready-to-go tablet holders that you can hook onto the front seat. It's like one of those touchscreens that they have on the new airplanes. Hundreds of movies to choose from, private and personal. What a great host! And those backseat passengers deserve even more comfort. Whip out some suction cups and make some extra storage. Your friends didn't even know they needed it. They can hang up some cloth to block the sun, a bag of chips, a portable fan. It's perfect. Until you accidentally roll down their window. The trunk. It's more like a luggage volcano than a tidy closet. It's messy. So why not improvise a do-it-yourself pop-up divider system to keep things tidy? You can use wood or just some trusty cardboard boxes. One section for food, one for useless papers, one for luggage, and one for that road map you haven't used in 10 years. Am I forgetting something? If you're on a long drive, 
Your back might start to hurt, and, oh man, you forgot to pack your air mattress. Just chuck a lumbar back support pillow under your seat and pull it out when you're feeling sore. Not all of us are great parkers, let's face it. You might have scraped your car a little now and then when you weren't being too careful. Pick up a few of those awesome rubber chickens that squawk when you squeeze them. Warning, you will look ridiculous, but you'll never scratch your car up again. Okay, get them out before parking and hook them to the front and back corners of your car. When you get too close to a post or wall or someone else's car, the chickens will belt out their epic song. And if you keep going anyway, they'll act as a soft bumper to protect your paint job. You made it home. The trip was a success. And now your car is seriously dirty. There's a few spots that you just can't clean. That's okay. Grab yourself a little slime. Yeah, you heard that right. Slime. Smear it on those spots where the muck just won't come off. That gunk will stick to the other gunk. Now you just wipe it all off. Don't know what slime is? You're in for a fun evening on YouTube. Do you have a fluffy friend that usually rides around with you in the back? Sure, it keeps you company, but wow, does it shed. Look at all that fur it left you as a thank you present. Uh, thanks. You love your dog, but come on, why can't they just shed in the backyard? Okay, dog rant over. Grab yourself a back seat cover, aka a blanket, long enough to cover the seat and the backrest. So even if your canine buddy moves around, all that extra hair goes right on the cover. Just remember to give it its own laundry cycle. You don't want hair all over your clean clothes. One of the most crucial rules for all those behind the wheel is never drive through standing water during a flood. It may seem like a small puddle at first sight, but in reality, it can be way deeper. Experts claim that a mere 12 inches of water can sweep your car off the road and carry it away. So if you got stuck in the water, climb out of your vehicle. It'll most likely stall after the water gets to the car's electronics. If possible, find higher ground and stay there. But if the water reaches your knees and is moving too fast, get to the roof of your car and wait for help there. Let's say you accidentally drive into a river or lake or your car falls off a bridge. If you can, immediately roll down all the windows. It seems counterintuitive since the water will rush inside right away, but it's actually a good thing. This way, the pressure outside and inside the car will become equal. It means you'll be able to swim out of the window or even open the door. The main point here is to act quickly before the electronics get wet and stop working. Then you won't be able to do anything. If you need to break the window, opt for a side one. Windshields are harder to smash since they're usually made thicker. After you get out of the car, don't linger around. Swim towards the shore. If you've heard a hurricane or storm with powerful winds approaching, don't risk it. Hide in a closet or a basement if you have one. If you see rising water outside, don't even think of wading it. The chances are it'll knock you over. If you notice the water rising already inside your house, try to get to the roof, but do it only if you know it's safe to do and the wind won't knock you down. Let's say you're lost in the wilderness and suddenly you spot a cave and can make a perfect shelter. You see some wood and tinder nearby and you've got matches. The odds are in your favor unless you make one grave mistake. Do not build a fire inside the cave. And that's not because of the smoke. The heat coming from the flames is likely to cause the rocks to expand. Then the walls and the ceiling of the cave can collapse and you may get trapped in a rockfall or landslide. To stay warm and safe at the same time, build a fire right outside the cave. When a person is choking, a constant supply of oxygen to their brain gets cut. That's why it's crucial to provide first aid as soon as possible. But what if you're the one who's choking and alone when it happens? First of all, make a firm fist and position it slightly higher than your belly button. Then cover your fist with your other hand and bend over a table, countertop, or chair. And finally, abruptly shove your fist inward and upward. This will make the stuck object move up. And one more way to help yourself is the head down position. You can use it as a last resort. Bend at your back until your body is almost perpendicular to the floor. Then lean down on your hands as if you're trying to touch the floor with your elbows. If you're tied up and lying in a puddle of mud or muddy water face down, arch your back. This will help get the air to your lungs faster and more easily. But this method won't work as effectively in rough waters. Instead, try to rotate your body. At the moment when your head is above the surface, take a deep breath and don't stop moving toward dry land. 
while being caught in an avalanche and getting dragged along with a huge mass of snow, try to stay on top of it. Make swimming motions with your whole body, as if moving against the river current. Once you feel the avalanche is slowing down, do your best to raise something above its surface. It can be your arm, leg, or a ski pole. This will help rescuers find you faster. With your other hand, make a small air pocket in front of your face. Try to breathe as slowly as you can to save air. To reduce the risk of getting hurt during an accident, keep your hands in the 10 and 2 o'clock position while driving. When your car hits something, this triggers the airbag safety system, and if your hands and arms are blocking the wheel at this moment, it'll end badly. While driving, try not to hunch. Your car's safety systems are designed to protect you, but only if you're in the regular driving position. If an accident did happen and you feel okay, check what parts of the vehicle are damaged. It'll help you figure out if it's safe to remain in the car until help arrives. If you have even the slightest doubt, get out of the car immediately. And if you decide to stay inside, turn off the engine. It'll lower the risk of the vehicle catching on fire. Never go on a hike without something you can use to make a fire. A lighter sounds good, but what if you lose it or drop it in the water? To play it safe, put some matchsticks in a plastic bag with a secure seal. This will protect the matches from getting wet, or you can cover their heads in wax. You can easily do it by dipping the matches into hot wax and leaving them to dry. This will make them waterproof, and when you need to use a match, you can just scrape the wax off the match's head. If you're at sea and spot a whirlpool nearing you, try to keep your cool. If you understand which way it's spinning, ride its side. Then use the whirlpool's current to catapult you out of danger. If you start fighting, you're likely to get pulled inside. There's also a chance a whirlpool will become weaker or dissolve altogether closer to the bottom. If you do get trapped by it, take a deep breath and wait for an opportunity to swim away and up. Imagine you're in the water, your hands and legs securely tied with a rope. First of all, do your best to suppress your instinctive urge to flail. Hold your breath and wait until you get down to the very bottom. Once you feel something solid beneath your feet, bounce off it and get back to the surface. Bend your knees and curl in on yourself. Then arch your back, lift your head above the water, and take a deep breath. Repeat the whole process again and again while moving toward the shore. Smoke is the worst thing about a house fire. If you get trapped in a burning building, try to stay low and crawl toward the nearest exit. The smoke usually rises toward the ceiling and crouching will prevent you from inhaling it. If you have a piece of cloth, put it against your mouth. It'll act as a filter against the smoke. If the elevator you're in suddenly starts falling, lie down on your back on the floor. Do your best to occupy as much space as possible. Your fat and muscle tissues will absorb most of the impact force. If you can't lie down, sitting is still better than standing. But whatever position you're in, make sure to cover your head. You can do it by putting one arm in front of your face and the other on the back of your neck. If you've fallen through the ice, get back to its edge as fast as you can. But don't try to pull yourself out by grabbing it. The edge will keep breaking, and it'll result in you wearing yourself out very fast. Kick your legs so that your body is positioned horizontally in the water. After that, carefully get onto the ice. Once you've made it there, remain lying. This way, your weight will be distributed over a larger area, and the ice will be less likely to break. Grease fires are very different from forest ones. That's why using water to put them out will not only fail to work, but will also make matters worse. If it's a fire in the kitchen, don't touch the burning pan and don't try to move it. Turn off the oven and put on an oven glove. It'll protect your skin. Then cover the flames with a lid. Do not use a ceramic one. Opt for metal. Use salt or baking soda to put out small fires, but never choose flour, sugar, or baking powder. All this stuff is flammable. Also, don't swat at the fire with a wet towel. It can cause the flames to flare up, or it'll knock the pan down, and the fire will spread all over your kitchen. Spread all. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. 
thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping cholla and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still, there's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpicid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. 
These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. If you're struggling with opening a container or a jar, don't exert yourself too much. Just run the lid under hot water for half a minute and then dry it for a better grip and see how it magically opens. If you're following a recipe that calls for both garlic and onions, add onions first. When you see they're almost translucent, that's the perfect moment to add garlic. Garlic will cook faster than onions, so if you put both of these products in a pan at the same time, the garlic will burn and your meal won't taste as good. You're a fan of avocados? Here's how you can easily check if one is ripe or not. Just take a look at its tail. If you can pull it out without any difficulties, the avocado is good to eat. If you can't do it easily, better leave it for a couple of days since it's not ripe yet. Here's how you can tell if an egg is fresh or not. Break it and check the yolk. If you can see that it has a clear circle of white surrounding it and is located in the middle, you have a fresh egg. The yolk is supposed to be voluminous too. If it's flat, it's better not to eat the egg. If you see that the white part doesn't have clear borders and your egg spreads around, the chances are it's spoiled. To tell the quality of your eggs, put a raw one while it's still in the shell into a bowl of water. If the egg remains on the bottom, you're good to go. If one of its sides comes closer to the water surface, your egg is not fresh, but you can still eat it. But if it floats, it's not fresh enough to consume. Brushing your teeth in the morning and before you go to bed doesn't have to be the same process. It's important to brush your teeth in the morning, but more so that you have fresh breath. But in the evening, you should brush your teeth more thoroughly because that's how you can prevent bacteria from breeding and protect your gums and teeth. Speaking of bad breath, want to know a good trick to fight it in no time? Cucumber slices. If you don't have a mint within reach, simply eat a slice of cucumber to fix this problem. 
When you buy natural peanut butter, store it upside down. That way, it won't separate into solids and oils as much. And you'll bring the oils to the top, which is why the peanut butter will be easier to mix. When you put something down for a while, comment it out loud. For example, I put my phone on the floor right next to my bed. When you do this, you engage multiple parts of your brain, including the language centers, and create a more vivid memory. That way, you'll be less likely to forget about it. You can do the same when you, for example, blow out a candle, unplug your hair straightener, turn off your stove burners, or take your keys, wallet, and other stuff when you leave the house. You'll get rid of many of those moments of doubt that make you wonder if you really did those things. If you visit your friend and bring along something you don't want to forget when you leave, just put it next to your car keys. That's something you definitely can't leave without. If it's hard for you to make a decision, flip a coin. It's not really about letting it decide for you. But while you're waiting to see the result, your mind will automatically start thinking about the outcome you really want, but perhaps can't admit out loud. You're in the supermarket and want to know if the pumpkin you're holding is good or not. Just knock on it. Does it sound as if it's empty inside? That's a good sign. Meanwhile, on the outside, it should be solid. Sometimes we dispose of foods that are still good to consume, like yogurt that's become layered. You know that layer of liquid on the top? That's just whey that contains nutrients. Stir your yogurt to make it smooth because it's still good to eat. When you're buying chicken, check if there's liquid around it. It's better when it doesn't have it. For instance, if you take some frozen chicken out of the freezer and see a lot of ice around the piece, it's better not to eat it. You're moving into a new apartment or house? Set up your bedroom first. Buy a bed before anything else. When you're exhausted after carrying your stuff around and cleaning the whole day, you'll just want to have a comfortable place to rest. Here's a trick that will help you figure out if your coconut oil is adulterated. Leave it in the fridge for half an hour. Coconut oil becomes solid at low temperatures. Adulterant oils detach and you can see them as a separate layer. When you want to check if an onion has some mold, just take a look at what's under the first layer of peel. Do you see stains that look as if the peel has faded? Mold. Better avoid buying this vegetable. Or make sure to remove all that mold if you've already got it. You can determine whether a lemon is ripe or not by eye. If its skin is smooth and has a rich yellow color, it's ripe. A greenish tint, as well as a pale yellow color, tells you it's ready to be used yet. This one's for coffee lovers. If you really want to enjoy your overall coffee experience, it's way better to buy beans and grind them yourself. Or ask if a salesperson can do it in the store when you buy your coffee. That's the best way to make sure that the product is really made without any extra additions that can be present in a regular ground coffee. If you're looking for a simple way to separate yolks from egg whites, try this. Take a clean and empty plastic water bottle, crack an egg into a bowl, squeeze the bottle over the yolk, and slowly release it. This way, you'll create a vacuum which will make the yolk slide into the bottle. Ta-da! It's separated from the white, just like that. Let's say you lost an earring or some other small item in the house. A vacuum cleaner will help. Just don't forget to pop a stocking over its head. This way, the item won't get lost in the dust and dirt inside the vax bag. You want to take your favorite lotion with you on a trip, but it takes up too much space? Try using a contact lens case. It doesn't need a lot of space, and it's a perfect solution for short trips. A hair straightener is a surprisingly good tool when it comes to ironing collars, especially if you're not a fan of regular ironing. When you want to check if your batteries are good or bad, just drop them on the table from approximately 6 inches. If they bounce once and fall right over, they're good to go. If they bounce around more than that, they're either done or on the way out. If your razor doesn't have a plastic cap, just use a binder clip to cover it. And to protect the rest of your stuff if you're packing it with some sensitive items or materials. Nail polish is a simple yet effective way to differentiate your keys, especially if they're all similar. Finally, you don't have to try each of them before getting to the right one. When you're reheating leftovers in a microwave, space out a circle in the middle of your dish. This way, your food will heat up more evenly. Straw is a cool tool to remove strawberry stems, don't you think? 
a muffin tin definitely comes in handy when you want to serve different condiments for your barbecue. Plus, it will save you some time with the dishes later. Well, it's a nice Sunday afternoon and you're shopping at your regular grocery store when you stumble upon a bloated package in the fresh produce aisle. You check the product information. It seems well within its expiration date. Then why the unusual shape, you may wonder? The answer is not always straightforward. For some types of fresh products, such as meat, fish, or seafood, sometimes even salads and cheese, scientists came up with something called MAP, or Modified Atmosphere Packaging, to ensure that these types of products with a relatively short shelf life stay fresh for as long as possible. A combination of gases is introduced in the packaging. It happens even before the product reaches your local grocery store. A French professor at the Montpelier School of Pharmacy stumbled upon this method after he noticed that fruits tend to stay fresh for longer periods of time in low-oxygen storage conditions. The types of gases in MAPS packaging can vary from product to product, but the main idea is to replace or reduce the content of oxygen. It's generally replaced with either nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Keep in mind that just because a bloated bag Mm. of salad is within its expiration date, it doesn't mean it's always safe to eat. The gases inside the bag may very well be there for their own purpose, but they can also be a sign that the product is spoiled. That's why the best course of action when shopping would be to check if the product is not expired. If it's still within the day, Mm -hmm. check for any unusual odors or damage to Mm -hmm. the packaging. If something seems off, it's best not to risk it. You can reach out to any of the store staff if you have any questions or concerns. Most supermarkets these days have a layout which allows for a logical shopping order, like buying non-perishable items first, then adding refrigerated or frozen products. Fruits and vegetables should come last since you won't want them at the bottom of your shopping cart. Nobody likes a squished tomato. While I'm on the subject of fruits and veggies, try to get them earlier in the morning if possible. Veggies that have been sitting out all day may lose some of their shape and texture, while others may be a bit wilted away. Quick tip on waste management, never buy more produce than you intend to use in a week. Most fruits and vegetables don't even last that long, so it's best not to give in to cravings. Shopping on a full stomach might help with that as well just as much as going shopping with a pre-made list of things you need to buy. Thoroughly inspecting the package of every product might save you some hustle later as well. Refrigerated products need to feel cold to the touch, whilst frozen ones need to be solid and with no sign of leakage. When you get home, make sure you refrigerate all the necessary items as soon as possible. Generally, they shouldn't be out of the refrigerator for more than two hours. Otherwise, their quality won't stay the same. Buying potted herbs from the grocery store may not be the first thing on your list, but it's surely something to consider. Not only are they available for a fraction of the cost, but they're also easy to grow and take care of. Just picture a nice herb garden right there on your balcony or even in the kitchen. Wouldn't that be nice? You'll always have fresh basil to top a mouth-watering pasta dish. Since you're still at the grocery store, pick up some coffee filters while you're at it. You may not have a machine at home that actually uses filters, but there are a lot more things you can use them for around the house. They can be used for straining liquids, safely stacking delicate china in your cupboards, or even polishing windows, or shoes for that matter. If your favorite fruits and vegetables are on sale, but buying large quantities would mean they go to waste, consider freezing them. You can stock up on items for smoothies, especially for the colder season when there are limited options for fresh fruits. And don't just grab the first thing on the shelf, especially if it's likely to go bad quickly. Stores restock their produce following a first-in, first-out layout. So the items at the back of the shelf will always be a tad bit fresher. The same goes for tea if you prefer it to coffee. Switch to buying loose-leaf tea, and you'll not only reduce the cost, you'll also be able to make your own homemade tea blends. Loose-leaf tea also has a stronger flavor than tea sold in tea bags. As for the other household stuff, stock up on items such as light bulbs, paper towels, or batteries. Chances are you'll always be needing at least Mm -hmm. one of these items, so it's best to buy them in larger quantities when on sale. They never go to waste, and let's face it, it's always annoying when you run out of batteries at home and your TV remote stops working. 
Hey, tell me about it. Try to reduce the number of times you go to the grocery store to buy just one item. It's inefficient, and most likely, you'll end up buying things that you don't actually need. Uh, That shopping list starts to make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Another list worth making, the one containing whatever you have in the fridge. Try to create such a list at least twice a week. Meal planning for at least a week in advance will also help you reduce impulse buying. If you already know what you'll want for dinner on Wednesday, why add anything else to the card if it's unnecessary? At the same time, start getting creative with your leftovers. There's no need for them to go to waste when you can mix and match or add some additional herbs and flavors to spice them up. Store leftovers in transparent containers for added visibility. And don't be afraid to set out a leftover day during the week. It's also nice to look at them as ingredients rather than leftovers. Use extra leftover pasta or steamed vegetables for a frittata or an (laughs) omelet. Blend together cooked vegetables with some tomatoes to create a pasta sauce. Put together some wraps for the next day's lunch with anything from leftover cooked rice to meat and vegetables. Or, if you're really looking for the easiest method to save leftovers, you can always turn them into soup. Last night's vegetable side dish can turn into a wholesome lunch if you simply add a can of broth and blend it all together. Even a two-day-old loaf of bread can be salvaged if you cut it diagonally, sprinkle the slices with some herbs and olive oil, and pop them in the oven for a couple of minutes. You'll then have yourself some nice homemade croutons for that previously mentioned soup. A little label know-how never hurt anyone either. Be on the lookout for ingredients you've never heard of or those you can't pronounce. An item that usually has more than five ingredients listed on the packaging should be avoided. Even the way you carry your groceries in the supermarket can affect how and what you buy. If you prefer baskets to shopping carts, you're more prone to impulse searches. That's what a study published by the Journal of Marketing Research claims. It happens due to the effort you put in actually carrying the items around. Choosing a shopping cart will most likely make you comfortable enough to browse through enough products and read labels thoroughly. When your grocery list is not too big, go for the self-checkout aisle if available. Studies have shown that impulse purchases are lowered by up to 32% if you actually scan your own items on the way out. That's because the regular checkout line is specially designed to keep you from letting go of any items you might have reconsidered buying. There's literally nowhere you can put down your undesired products outside of your grocery cart, and if there's anyone else waiting in line behind you, good luck sliding out. The food arrangement on the shelves can also pose a threat to both your budget and your habits. Since people are more inclined to buy the items they see first, the most expensive products are placed at eye level, and the budget options are placed on the top and bottom shelf. Take your time and scan your aisles of interest you'll be surprised to see that most items placed on higher or lower shelves are often not only more cost-effective, but also less packed with additives or artificial flavoring. Hey, be careful. It's a jungle in there. Well, well, you had a busy day sightseeing in a new city. You constantly used navigation, took 5,000 pictures, and video called your best friend every 10 minutes. All this drained your phone battery to 12%. And you still have to do a live stream of fireworks, book a room for the night, and find your way there. You decide to try all the possible ways to save battery somehow. You shut down all the apps one by one. Bye-bye, Messenger, photo editing app, no more shopping online, force quit this and that. And your battery drops to 7%. You want to spend them wisely and Google the matter. Turns out, closing background apps eats more battery than letting them run loose. When you force quit an app, your phone spends its precious juice on closing the app and clearing it from RAM. And when you decide to open the app again, it'll spend more resources on bringing it back to life. When you leave one app and start using a different one, the first one is stored in RAM. It sits there quietly, in the ready-to-relaunch in exactly the same condition state, and will jump back into action without wasting any extra battery, time, or data. Your phone has its own memory management mechanisms. It'll close the apps that you haven't used for a long time or the ones that are using more battery than they should. 
you can help the system work smoothly and fast by not trying to do the job for the phone and let it decide which apps to keep running in the background. So you realize your phone won't last the evening, so you hop into the nearest hotel. Someone told you it helps if you drain the battery completely, but the internet says it's another myth. Batteries used in phones over 10 years ago lasted longer if you dropped them to zero before plugging the phone into an electricity source. Lithium-ion batteries used these days prefer going at somewhere between 30% and 80%. If you often let it drain completely before charging it again, you're adding unnecessary charge cycles. In that case, be prepared to replace the battery every 6 months or so. Now you need to charge your phone as fast as possible not to miss the fireworks. You remember everything you know about express charging and take the case off. Most of them are made of materials that stop the heat from going out. The lithium-ion battery inside your phone is most effective when it's cool. Cool. Too much heat slows it down and wears it out. The higher the temperature, the slower the charging process. There's a charging dock in your hotel room, but you don't use it. Energy transfers faster through a physical cable. Plus, all that energy spreading around on the charging pad or stand heats up your phone, which is no good. A USB port on your computer won't do your gadget any harm because it has a lower amperage. But it will do the job about two times slower. So you stick to a wall socket. Looks like it's too high and the phone will hang loose, which isn't safe. So you make a loop out of the cord and put your phone in that loop. It has to lie steadily in there not to drop out. Your phone charges by 5% and you start scrolling down your newsfeed. It's safe to use the phone while it's charging, but it'll seriously slow down the process. Instead, turn on airplane mode. It speeds up the charging process thanks to shutting down all possible radios, like cellular, GPS, Bluetooth, and the like, and all sounds. Plus, if you're in an area with bad coverage, it won't waste battery looking for signal. Your iPhone charges up to 80%. Most of them have optimized battery charging on by default. It studies your charging habits and slows down charging after 80% when you're sleeping or in some other situations. While you're connected to a power source, you update your OS. The latest version will always have patches and fixes for all sorts of issues, including charging problems. And newer operating systems work better with newer technologies, like the fast charging feature on Androids. Ah, done! Time to go see the fireworks! On your way there, you run into a store that sells fast chargers. You never trusted those, but a salesperson explains they're safe for your phone. They skyrocket to 60% in 10 to 30 minutes, and then charge at a regular speed to avoid too much current running into your phone. You can also pick up a new charger. Quality third-party ones have built-in safety mechanisms, just like the original chargers, and won't do your phone any harm. If your phone can handle 12 watts, getting a 10-watt charger will speed up the process. Most phones come with 5-watt chargers. A good cable can also be a real game-changer. There are four wires inside any of them, two for data transfer and two for charging. They set the limit to charging speed. The salesperson explains that if you want to go faster, you can upgrade from a standard cable to a high-quality one. You listen so attentively that you accidentally drop some soda on your old charger. Now you have no other choice but to replace it. Even a tiny drop of water or sweat can slow down the process or ruin it all. The salesperson also checked your lightning port. If there's a buildup of dust and lint in there, just like your belly button, you can't expect it to fly at the speed of lightning anymore. He carefully removes the clog up from the port with a toothpick. You can do the same at home. Your new friend hands you a manual on how to save battery, and you study it on the go. The first thing you do is change your wallpaper. Most new phones have an OLED display. When you see a dark wallpaper, it doesn't have to waste power on lighting up black pixels. So the larger the dark areas on the screen, the less battery it eats. You also turn on dark mode. It boosts up the battery a lot. To activate it, you open settings, display and brightness, and choose the dark option. You can choose to activate it at sunset or sunrise automatically every day. Android owners can do it in display, advanced. Find device theme near the bottom of the feature list and activate the dark setting. You deactivate the automatic brightness mode in settings, accessibility, display, and text size. It's brought to you by a light sensor that spends even more power on collecting and analyzing data about the surroundings to pick the right light level. 
If you have an Android, you can do it in Settings – Display. Choose to Disable Auto Brightness or Adaptive Brightness. So you manually dim your screen brightness to a comfortable level. You also shorten the auto lock time to a minimum. The sooner your screen goes off when you aren't using your phone, the less energy it's eating. You can adjust it in Settings, Display and Brightness, Auto Lock. On an Android, you can find it in Menu, Settings, Screen or Display. Here, you can select the right time period under Timeout or Screen Timeout. Boy, do I know about timeouts. The sun is about to set, but it's still super warm outside. That's not good for your battery that doesn't like extreme temperatures. That's why you shouldn't drop it in the car seat under the sun or use it when it's above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Crazy cold isn't much better. You'll see your battery drop and then go back to normal as it warms up. But it isn't healthy. Ring ring, you just got a promo email. Unless you need to stay up to date for work, you should be fine with your phone fetching mail every 30 minutes, hourly, or even manual checks for a secondary email. You can set your interval in Settings, Accounts, and Passwords under Fetch New Data. The longer the interval, the more battery you're saving. On an Android, go to the Settings menu and choose Email. In Common Settings section, tap on Settings menu. Select the account to adjust the settings, tap on Sync Settings, Sync Schedule, Set Sync Schedule, and pick the interval you like. You still have enough battery to find the best firework viewing location. It's to the right and up the hill. Wow, what a view! Now you can disable location services and start that live stream everyone has been waiting for. Well, it's that time of year again, spring cleaning. Making your way outside, you grab the duster and broom to get rid of all those cobwebs on your windows. They don't stand a chance this time. Removing one cobweb after the other, you suddenly notice some weird-shaped mud stuck under the eaves and porch. What's this? It suddenly dawns on you. These have to be mud dauber wasp nests. You're probably thinking there's a swarm of them around with so many nests being side by side. Luckily, mud dauber wasps are solitary insects. Whew! All those little mud huts are filled with paralyzed spiders. Sometimes, even up to 500 spiders can be trapped in these lockers, just waiting for the wasp young to hatch. If the nest has holes, it may indicate the nest is inactive or old, as mud dauber wasps create holes when they leave the nest. If you're not going to remove them, it's best to wait until nighttime when they're not as active. While they're pretty placid, if they feel threatened, they won't hesitate to sting. Looking like someone got halfway through building one insect and forgot what part came next, the mole cricket is one insect that really looks out of this world. With claws like a mole, a body of a cricket, and the head of a shrimp, this critter is like the platypus of the insect world. They're not venomous and will only bite if you trap them inside your hand. And if you really annoy it, it's got something else up its sleeve. The wings. They can spit a foul-smelling brown liquid from their body, just like a skunk. So just let them leave your home and there will be nothing to clean up. Rock pools are teeming with all sorts of plant and animal life. Sea creatures such as starfish, seagrass, hermit crabs, tiny fish, and all types of octopuses. If you come across this tiny blue-ringed octopus, it's best to leave it alone. It's flashing neon blue at you for a reason. This miniature octopus has a venomous bite that's a thousand times stronger than cyanide, with no antidote available. Don't poke it with a stick or try to pick one up. It's not worth the trip to the hospital or the morgue. Snakes on land are scary, but sea snakes are on an entirely different level. Found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, there are about 50 different species of sea snakes, and they're beautiful as much as they're dangerous. Luckily, they don't seem to worry about us too much. The Dubois sea snake is arguably the most venomous snake in the ocean, with the big sea snake not far behind. Their venom makes a cobra's bite seem like a walk in the park. The venom of both these snakes is extremely dangerous. Good thing for us that their venom can take hours to cause any symptoms in humans. If they can bite through your wetsuit, that is. 
Now, if this fly lands on your arm outside, you might just scream a little. Hey, I wouldn't blame you. The scorpion fly, as its name suggests, has a curved tail that looks just like a scorpion stinger. But you can breathe a sigh of relief. This is only used for mating. It also has a long beak-like head that's used to feed after stealing insects from spiders' webs. To find the perfect partner, they love to give the equivalent of a box of chocolates and flowers. Except theirs is saliva. Hmm, how romantic. If you happen to be in Africa, you might just miss this large bird if you're not paying attention. The shoebill will just casually stand still as you walk right on by. Growing up to 5 feet tall with an 8-foot wingspan, the shoebill sounds like an apex predator, though it's anything but. Known as one of the most slow-moving birds, almost statue-like, the shoebill just eats fish near the surface of the water without a care in the world. This bird isn't afraid of humans at all. While they won't naturally come over to talk about the weather, they'll allow us to get close enough for some photos. Now, if you hear a small squeaking sound while you're in the garden, it could be a mouse, a squirrel, or a rhinoceros beetle is letting you know that you are too close. They love to make a racket when bothered. With a giant scary horn on top of their head, they might seem like they're able to defend themselves with it. But that's not possible at all. That's only to move leaves and sticks out of their way, and to stop other males from coming into the female beetle's area. Not only have they got a horn on their head, but they've also got Herculean strength, able to lift 850 times their own weight. It's like you or me lifting 65 tons or 11 elephants. Hey, let's try it. Nah. Found mainly in China, the small tufted deer looks adorable with its tuft of hair. That is, until it turns around. Oh no, it's a vampire deer! Luckily, this animal doesn't want to taste your blood or wear a cape. Only males grow these during the mating season rather than antlers to fight over territories and female tufted deer. These fangs are more like elephant tusks than sharp teeth. Not only do they have fangs, but they're also known to bark like a dog and flee like a cat when they're scared. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. No one said anything about a red tide, though. The red tide is a toxic algal bloom that rises up from the seafloor after particularly bad storms. This algae looks a lot like spilled ketchup or rust in the water, but it's much worse for the life around it. Fish and marine life will try to escape once exposed to the toxic algae in their water. It's not particularly harmful to humans who are exposed to it. But if you eat seafood contaminated with its toxins, things can become a bit more serious. So if the sea is red, just stay out of the water. Some spiders love to show off with bright colors to show they're dangerous. Not the Sydney funnel web spider of Australia. This glossy black spider doesn't need theatrics to prove it's tough. These bad-tempered crawlers cause serious alarm when they decide to bite us. They can shut down our entire nervous system in as little as 30 minutes. Making their web in any shelter, like old logs, shoes, or even garden gnomes, the funnel web spiders like to live close to our surroundings for easy food. When they get tired of an area, they just leave their web behind and wander off to find somewhere new. <laughs> Perfect. Some say honey badgers don't care, and I think they might be right. When you're brave enough to take food away from a jaguar, lion, or hyena, hey, what do you got to fear? These tough relatives of the weasel aren't just ferocious, they're super smart. Known to even use tools to escape from enclosures. Objects like rakes, stones, and mud just become things to climb for freedom. Aside from their physical similarities to the skunk, the honey badger also boasts a dangerous gland in its tail containing a powerful stink machine. So they're tough, stinky, have extremely stretchy and strong skin, and to top it all off, they've got a strong immunity to scorpions and snakes. 
The best thing to do if you walk into a honey badger is to leave it alone. What chance do we have? Ever heard of the fungus strawberries and cream? No? What about its other name? The bleeding tooth fungus. This fungus isn't toxic, but tastes so bitter that you might think twice about trying some. When young and growing, this white mushroom appears to have red jelly coming out of its pores. This sticky liquid is sap that's pushed up from taking on too much water. The adult mushroom is just a boring beige compared to this. Underneath the mushroom cap, where its spores are produced, it has a tooth-like structure just to make it even weirder. Tasmanian devils have a reputation for being bad-tempered when threatened by a predator, fighting other males, or getting a place at the table for dinner. They're dubbed devils because of the teeth-bearing, lunging, and one of the scariest shrieks you'll ever hear in the middle of the night. They'll also eat pretty much anything they can get a hold of, too. They don't habitually go for people, although they will defend themselves if they're cornered. With such a powerful bite, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end. Good thing the Tassie Devils would much rather escape as well. Well, it's time to stretch your legs and take a walk in the park. The sun is shining, and you enjoy the weather and life on the whole. That's when you spot a rapidly growing vertical cloud. Bright white at first, it's approaching alarmingly fast, becoming dense and inky. The sky is darkening, and a gust of wind blows the hat off your head. And then, your hair starts to stand on end. That's your cue to run for your life. You're about to be hit by lightning. At this very moment, positive charges are rising through your body. They're reaching toward the negatively charged part of the storm. If you don't react fast, these charges will meet, and it'll end badly for you. If there's nowhere you can hide, crouch down and try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Don't lie flat on the ground. It may be wet and thus a great conductor of electricity. There are also other signs that scream danger during a lightning storm. Your palms may begin to sweat. You might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your skin can start to tingle. There might be a strange metallic taste in your mouth. If you're sure you're not chewing on tinfoil, then look out. Plus, you're likely to smell chlorine. That's ozone. Electrical charges split the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, which are the main gases forming the atmosphere, into separate atoms. When these atoms come together again, some of them produce molecules made up of three oxygen atoms. That's ozone. You can smell it during a thunderstorm because downdrafts bring it from high altitudes to your nose level. You can figure out how close a thunderstorm is by measuring the time between spotting the lightning and hearing the thunder. Every five seconds is one mile. The sky over your head is darkening and turning ominously green. Something hits you on the cheek. Ouch, it hurts. You pick up the offending object. It's a massive hailstone. But it's not that cold outside, and it's not raining. You notice how still everything is, how quiet. There's no wind whatsoever. It makes you think about the calm before the storm. And indeed, soon you hear some noise. It's approaching rapidly and turns into a loud roar, as if a freight train is moving towards you. Only, it's not a train. It's a tornado, and you have almost no time to escape. The funnel isn't visible behind a cloud of debris. But you can't mistake this rotating column of air for anything else. If the tornado catches you on the road, get as far from your car as you can. This will prevent the vehicle from being hurtled toward you. Find a ditch, lie down in it, and cover your head. If you're inside, get away from windows and hide underground if possible. Now, you're at the seaside, walking along the shore and enjoying a light breeze. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking under your feet. Must be an earthquake! The next weirdness you notice is the water retreating from the beach at breakneck speed. It leaves behind the exposed ocean floor, reefs, and even fish. That's when you hear a distant roaring sound. It's a tsunami, and you only have a few minutes to save your life. Get to high ground immediately. A giant wave is already speeding toward the shore. It's not the only way a tsunami can creep up on you. It doesn't necessarily come crashing against the shore as a series of huge waves. 
a tsunami can look like a rapidly rising tide. It usually goes hand-in-hand with severe underwater turbulence. It pulls people under the surface and tosses heavy objects around. You can also notice seawater bubbling, swirling, and creating bizarre patterns. It's another sure sign a tsunami's coming. Your dog's restless. It's scratching the entrance door, roaming around the apartment, and trying to hide in the corner. Usually calm and docile, the pooch is now howling and barking. The weather's also been crazy for the past several days. It's hot one day and chilly 24 hours later. Plus, you've noticed that the stream near your house has livened up, bubbling as it's rushing past. Only when glasses start to clink in your cupboard do you realize what it means. The clatter is produced by four shocks, tiny earthquakes leading up to the main event. Earthquakes often occur in clusters. If there are several weak quakes, a much bigger one might be on the way. Sometime before the disaster strikes, you might notice bizarre blue lights. Some of them seem to be coming from the ground, others are hovering in the air. These are so-called earthquake lights. Emitted from rocks under great stress, they can be seen days or mere seconds before the ground starts shaking. At the same time, some experts doubt earthquake lights exist. If you think an earthquake is about to happen and there's a catfish in your aquarium, pay attention to its behavior. Scientists have proved this species can react to earth tremors. The fish become restless when seismic activity is high. Some bugs can feel a storm coming. They get ready for the natural disaster by stopping any movement. That's why, if you notice that lots of insects around you look drowsy, search for shelter. As for bees, they can predict heavy rainstorms. They begin to work much harder the day before it starts raining. Square waves occur when two wave patterns crash into each other. This phenomenon looks awesome, but only if you're watching it from the shore. Don't even think of getting in the water to play in such waves. In that place, there are cross currents that can easily pull even a skilled swimmer under the surface. And if you see wild choppy waves carrying ocean debris and seaweed, stay out of the water too. It can be a sign of a strong rip current. It can carry you far away from the ocean. If you see smelly green stuff on the surface of a lake or sea, stay away from the water. It can be a hazardous algal bloom. You won't be able to tell whether it's toxic or not at first sight. That's why it's better to steer clear of it altogether. Three or four days before a hurricane arrives, the sea or ocean surface can swell up to six feet. Waves hit the shore every nine seconds. The closer the hurricane, the more rapidly the waves crash against the shore. They also get higher, sometimes up to 16 feet. The sky is littered with light, fluffy clouds. Roughly 36 hours before the hurricane reaches the shore, the atmospheric pressure begins to drop. After that, the wind speeds up. Wispy, hair-like clouds appear in the sky. 18 hours before the hurricane makes it to the shore, the sky opens up and it starts to pour. The rainwater often floods low-lying areas, welling up to 15 feet. When the hurricane is 12 hours away, a powerful gale starts to bring along loose debris. Six hours before the landfall, the wind speed is already 90 miles per hour. It's strong enough to break and even uproot trees, fling around large debris, and flip cars. By the way, let's say you're sailing and there are some sharks circling your boat. Keep an eye on them. If the predators suddenly leave you alone and head for deep water, it might mean a hurricane is drawing closer. Get back to dry land as fast as you can and warn others. If during a period of heavy rains, you hear a roaring sound, it might be a flash flood moving in your direction. If you're near a river at that moment, you might see debris coming down with the flow. The water can be changing its color and becoming cloudier and darker. These signs should set alarm bells ringing in your head. If your gut feeling is right, you have no time to waste. Try to get away from that place as fast as you can. Flash floods are often lethal. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If it's falling or rising rapidly, it might be a sign a landslide is about to happen. And if you see the water turn muddy, don't wait for more evidence. Get out of the area immediately.
You wake up in the middle of the night from the feeling as if someone's peering at you from the darkness. You open your eyes and see... Oh, hi, Biscuit. It's your pet hamster that you took in just yesterday. It's sitting right before you. And there's something primal about it. Suddenly, the hamster stands up on his hind legs and howls like a wolf, only much higher, like a whistle. Then, Biscuit scampers to the window, takes one last look at you, and jumps out into the street. What in the world was that? Calm down. It's just that what you took for a hamster was really a werewolf mouse. Or simply, grasshopper mouse. It's a perfect hunter. It's agile, quick, and doesn't feel pain. The mouse lives in North America and doesn't like digging holes. Why work if you can drive the owners out of their homes? This cute ball of fuzz preys on grasshoppers, snakes, and spiders. But most of all, it loves dangerous prey. Arizona bark scorpions are extremely venomous, but our cutie here, he doesn't care. Over millions of years of evolution, the rodent learned to process scorpion neurotoxins into an energy drink. The venom is, for this mouse, like 100 cups of coffee for you. Plus, it helps you not feel pain. The more venom in the mouse's body, the more it looks like a Viking gone berserk. After the battle, the rodent raises its head into the night sky and howls. The sound is more like a whistle, but loud. If the animal howled in the center of a soccer field, you'd hear it from the stands. This way, the mouse makes itself known and tells everyone, I'm in charge here, so don't you dare cross me. You don't believe? <laughs> Ask the poor scorpion. So when you woke up in your room, your mouse was singing a victory song. It may have just chased away a poisonous insect that had infiltrated your room. Nature took pity on humanity and made the grasshopper mouse small. But if you see one close by, then get out of there quickly. It means the werewolf mouse is hunting and there's a scorpion somewhere near. Mouse cubs, even in captivity, remain aggressive. They're like the Spartan children of antiquity. From the first days of life, they're ready to fight. Imagine that you got a job in a company creating our planet. You come to the office and your boss says, Newbie, I need a project on a new animal on my desk tonight. Beside yourself, you tried a bit too hard, and the result was the platypus. The animal is covered with soft fur. It's got a tail like a beaver's, flippers, and a duck's bill. The platypus lays eggs, but it feeds its young with milk. You've got a crazy imagination. Male platypuses have venomous spurs on their hind legs. The venom isn't dangerous to humans, but you still better avoid petting the animal. If it stings you with those spurs, then a week of severe pain is guaranteed. What animal has the nastiest temperament on the planet? That's easy, a honey badger. Most of all, it resembles a skunk that visits the wrestling gym five times a week. And it smells like that, too. The honey badger weighs as much as a two-year-old child, but it's not afraid of anyone. It doesn't care who's confronting it, be it a venomous snake, two lions, or a pack of hyenas. It'll attack them and win. You want honey? No problem. Befriend a badger, and it'll demolish a beehive for you. It's not afraid of stings, the honey badger has thick skin that's difficult to break through, and also sharp claws and strong jaws. The honey badger scares everyone in Africa, but it's got cousins in North America and Eurasia. Those guys have a bad temper too. Although it's difficult to call it a giant, wolverines will not hesitate to attack a bear or an elk. The animal grows no larger than a medium-sized dog. If you offended it, then I don't envy you. It's hardy, knows how to swim, and is a fast runner. Wide paws are like snowshoes and don't allow it to fall into the snow. You can't hide from a wolverine on a tree either. It climbs with uncanny agility. The wombat is a cute animal that resembles a fluffy bear. 
It's stocky and weighs as much as a German shepherd. The wombat lives in Australia, where it digs deep holes and has the most original protection in the world. If the enemy tries to get into its underground house, the wombat blocks the entrance with its, um, backside. This part of the body consists of four fused bones. For a wombat, it's sort of a shield, and it's difficult for a predator to bite through it. The animal is peaceful, but it has poor eyesight, and, well, it isn't very smart. If it thinks you're posing a threat, it will attack. The Indian Grey Mongoose is a real champion when it comes to fighting cobras. During the fight, it's beautiful and dances so fast that the snake doesn't have time to react to tricks. The cobra gets tired and decides to run away as soon as possible. The animal is protected from cobra fangs by its thick fur and immunity to cobra venom. Mongooses are relatives of cats and are popular pets in India. The animals love to sit on their owner's lap, but retain a wild character. In nature, mongooses rarely attack people, but if cornered, they become unpredictable. Nobody knows how many rats there are on the planet exactly, but at least twice as many as us humans. These are amazing animals that can laugh, dream, and feel stress. They live in packs and can hunt prey dozens of times larger than themselves. Scientists have found rat bite marks on the ribs of dinosaurs that are 75 million years old. They also have kings. They don't wear crowns, though. It's the name for several rats whose tails are tied in a knot. The largest king ever recorded consisted of 32 animals. Possums have been around since the days of the dinosaurs. Their acting skills help them survive to this day. As soon as danger appears nearby, this hero rarely rushes into the fray, but it doesn't run away either. It falls to the ground and starts, well, playing possum. It doesn't move at all and even slows down its breath and heartbeat. I'm sure this animal deserves an Oscar. For realism, this actor releases a scent. It's so bad that predators would rather stay hungry than approach a possum. The animal has no control over its acting ability. It's a natural response to stress. Possums aren't aggressive, but if cornered, they growl. Their fur stands on end, and they show their teeth. Small, but razor sharp. You won't call the Selenodon a nice guy. You can recognize it by red hair, a Pinocchio nose, and a hairless long tail. It's got sharp teeth, and special glands in its mouth make its saliva toxic. Surprisingly, the animal has no immunity against its own venom. That's why it's really careful while grooming. Selenodons are aggressive by nature. If it gets bored, it gets angry, grunts like a pig, and can lunge at anyone in the vicinity. Luckily, its toxic saliva isn't harmful to humans. The pygmy gerboa is the smallest rodent on Earth. It looks like a baby kangaroo and weighs a little more than a penny. The largest is the capybara, and it's difficult to look at without a smile. But this isn't the limit. Millions of years ago, a rodent the size of an African buffalo lived on the planet. Phoberomys ate plants and resembled both a hippo and an overgrown guinea pig at the same time. Now, the next animal would easily win the first prize for the most unusual rodent on the planet. This monster is a naked mole rat. And yes, it's naked and lives underground. Its appearance is too much, even for a rodent. Most of all, the mole rat looks like a sausage from a horror movie. But that's not the point. On average, a rodent of this size lives for two to three years. Naked mole rats live in the wild for 30 years. Imagine if people could live to be a thousand years old. For a rodent, 30 is pretty much the same. Scientists believe that perhaps this unsightly digger will help humanity solve the problem of aging. One family can have up to 300 naked mole rats. In the concrete hard African soil, they dig cities the size of six football fields. People don't meet these rats, 
They rarely come to the surface and drink no water. These rodents get moisture from plant roots. Now, a basic sponge and baking soda can make a great eraser for little grease spots, fingerprints, and stains on your walls, or many other painted areas such as furniture or wood fences. Just sprinkle a bit of baking soda on your dry sponge and scrub the stain area in a circular motion. And then use a clean, dry cloth to wipe the baking soda off to get rid of any remaining dirt. If you're worried that this technique might ruin the paint, try just a bit of soda first and see how the surface reacts. If you want to extract the maximum amount of juice from your lemon or lime, put them first in a microwave for 15 seconds. After that, give them a little roll on a hard surface. And now, feel free to use your manual juicer. When you smash some glass or pottery on the floor, it can be pretty hard to notice and pick up all the tiny fragments, especially if the glass is transparent. Guess what can help you? A slice of bread. After you remove all the big pieces, carefully wipe a thick slice of bread across the floor to pick up any tiny fragments. They should just get stuck in the bread. But make sure to do this very carefully or just put on protective gloves. And don't absentmindedly make yourself a sandwich right afterwards. Hey, just saying. If you're a huge fan of garlic, here's a tip for you. Cut one garlic bulb in half and rub an empty bowl for a nice flavor. Now you can put your pasta, risotto, or salad in the bowl and enjoy your meal. Pringles tubes are made from a mixture of paper, plastic, and metal which makes them a good option to organize groceries. You can paint the tubes in a plain color to make them match your stylish, minimalistic kitchen and then attach removable labels on the side. Have you ever struggled with threading a needle? Here's an easy way out. Place your toothbrush on the table and put the thread across the bristles of the brush. Now gently push the needle down over the top. The bristles will help you poke the thread up through the eye effortlessly. Once you got the loop, just use your fingers to pull it through. If you've got these annoying tea stains on your favorite mug that won't wash off, try to apply some toothpaste to your sponge. This is also applicable when you need to make your dirty cutlery shine. It's best to use a mildly abrasive sponge. It's pretty helpful when it comes to removing dark spots on dishes. Now let's say you've recently received a really gorgeous bouquet. But the flowers got this sad look in a blink of an eye. You can extend their living very easily and almost free of charge. First, fill the vase or vase with fresh water and put a couple of teaspoons of sugar. This will help to nourish the flowers. Before you put the flowers back into the vase, cut about an inch off the stem. But make sure to slice it at an angle like this. This trick will increase the surface of water absorption. Repeat this with all the stems, especially with hard ones. Now put the bouquet back into the vase or vase. The flowers should cheer up within 12 hours. If you suffer from cold feet, put them into a vase or vase. No, wait. Use a hairdryer to warm up your slippers before using them. This tip is also applicable to your outdoor winter shoes. Speaking of feet, pew, there's a great way to get rid of unpleasant smells. Apply about 10 drops of your favorite essential oil on two cotton balls. Now place the balls into the shoes and leave them overnight. Remove them in the morning and enjoy the fancy smell. You can also mix a couple of your favorite fragrances to customize your shoe fragrance even more. If your drain is a bit dirty and smelly, there's an epic tip to solve this issue. Put down a couple of spoonfuls of baking soda and pour down a little vinegar. And now step back and enjoy the show. It will foam up and help loosen any dirt. We've all tried to light a match outdoors in windy weather and failed. Well, we've been doing it all wrong. There's an easy way to prepare a matchstick in advance using a sharp knife. Carefully carve back the four corners just behind the head of the matchstick. Then repeat the same technique one more time so it looks like this. These eight little splinters will help create a stronger wind-resistant flame. If you have a small wardrobe with limited space for hanging new clothes, remove some metal pull tabs from the tops of old drinking cans. They can make the perfect holding loops for fixing the second hanger. Just put the ring over the hook. This is how you can double and even triple the storage space on one hanging rail. 
if you need to make an emergency candle, you can use one very common item from your fridge. Have you guessed what it is? Butter. Cut off a piece of chilled butter and place it on a heat-proof dish. Poke a hole straight down through the center using a toothpick or a wooden stick. Now we need a wick. You can use a common cotton string or twine. Cut the corresponding length and poke it through the hole so it goes all the way to the bottom of your candle. Gently coat the end of the wick with butter and light up your brand new DIY candle. Use hair straightening tongs to smooth out those annoying creases on your tie. Or let's say you're working in a shop and you have to deal with fluffy piles of cash. The tongs will help you iron your money to put them in smaller stacks, which then fit neatly into your backpack. Hey, let's not go there. Wow, this zipper is tough. Why can't it slide smoothly like all other zippers? But don't rush to throw away your coat. Grab a bar of soap and gently rub it up and down against the zipper. Repeat it on both sides. Can you feel the difference? Cut one leg off your old tights and put two long cardboard tubes inside it. Go ahead and thread it under your internal door with one tube on each side. This will protect you from any draft because the tights will seal up any gap under the floor. You can also use this trick when you need to make a full blackout in the room. Just make sure to use thick black tights. Let's say you're visiting a conference in another city, and your schedule will be very busy. You can prepare your outfits for each day in advance and put them into different compartments of your hanging clothes storage organizer this way. Now, put it right down into your suitcase, zip it, and you're ready to go! When you arrive at the hotel, you can just carefully pull out this organizer and hang it in the closet in just two seconds. But don't forget to take the shoes, too. Is there a way to drive a nail into a wall without hurting your fingers? The answer is yes. Grab your comb and push the nail in between the prongs. This way, you'll keep your fleshy fingers far away and safe. And once you've got it started, you can easily slide out the comb and finish driving the nail. If you need an emergency metal scrubby sponge to wash your pot or pan, use a piece of tin foil. Crumple it up into a ball, apply a little bit of dish soap, and your brand new sponge is ready. Now start scrubbing and get ready to be amazed! It works really well, huh? By the way, the tin foil doesn't have to be new. You can recycle the piece you've already used for cooking. And the final tip is for perfectionists. If your shower head has a hard water buildup, the water won't come out straight. To fix this, fill a plastic bag with plain white vinegar. Then put the shower head inside the bag, attach it with a band, and leave it overnight. In the morning, you can give your shower head a little scrub with an old toothbrush or clothes brush. This should help remove the remaining hard water dirt. This trick is also applicable for faucet heads. Yep, moving objects through a door when it keeps closing is super annoying. So instead, tie a rubber band around the handle on each side of the door so that it crosses over the latch. The latch then won't be able to pop out, and the door won't lock shut. To check whether your bed sheets are fully dried, take a mirror and place it underneath. Leave it there for around 5 minutes, and if it steams up, it means the sheets are still damp. A damp bed can be a breeding ground for mold and other nasty fungi. You can paint the end of your keys with different colored nail polish so that you can easily identify which key is which. In order to pour the perfect amount of oil or salad dressing, poke holes in the foil seal rather than removing it completely. This prevents a big amount rushing out quickly. To prevent band-aids from slipping off your finger, cut a line on either side. This will create four smaller sticky strips rather than one large one and it will be much easier to secure. If you enter a public restroom and see a red Solo cup someone put under the seat, better choose another booth. It means there's no toilet paper in this one. The red cup is a frequent replacement for a toilet paper hub, which is also put under the seat for the same reason. Speaking of restrooms, almost any public toilet has a large gap between the floor and the door. The reason for such a zero-privacy thing is to actually minimize the level of privacy and comfort so that people won't stay there long and there'd be no lines. It's also to clean and safer if some emergency occurs. 
Forgot to put your drink in the fridge? Wrap a wet paper towel around it and put it in the freezer. In just 15 minutes, your drink will be ice cold. Instead of filling your purse or wallet with store loyalty cards, you can take a photo of them. Just take one snap of the barcode as well as a picture of the front so you know which card it is. Then, when you visit the store, just scan the barcode on your phone to collect your points. If you're using your phone to watch something and are tired of propping it up and having it fall back down, try using your sunglasses. Simply place them upside down and use the parts that go around your ears to hold the phone in place. Now, if you don't have the correct size coin to put in your shopping cart next time you go to the supermarket, you can use your key instead. If you have a key with a rounded end, you can insert that where the coin would go and the cart should unlock. If you're struggling to get your taco shells to stay in place, use a muffin tray. Flip the tray upside down, spray it with oil, and place your tortillas in the gap. Cook them for around 10 minutes at 700 degrees Fahrenheit for the perfect crispy taco shell. You can use a water bottle to separate egg yolks. Hold the bottle over the yolk and squeeze it to suck the yolk up. Drop it into a separate bowl and you're good to go. Next time you're struggling to clean your ceiling fan, use a pillowcase. Slide the pillowcase over each blade to wipe off the dust. This way, excess dust is caught inside the pillowcase and won't rain down on you. To properly clean your blender, fill it with soap and hot water. Switch it on for around 10 seconds and let the swirling water do the hard work. Then just rinse it off and it's clean. Put down a strip of masking tape before nailing into plaster walls. The tape should stop the plaster from flaking or spreading dust all over the floor. If your shoes smell bad, put a few dry tea bags into the shoe. The tea bags will absorb the smell. Try using toothpaste to remove small scratches on furniture. Rub a peanut-sized amount on the scratch in a circular motion until the scratch buffs out. Then wipe it with a damp cloth and voila! Drill a couple of small holes in the bottom of your trash can to stop the bag getting stuck when you pull it out. The holes stop the vacuum-like effect that keeps the bag pinned down. You can easily remove the sticky residue from jars using cooking oil. Soak a cotton pad in some oil, then rub it on the sticky area. Allow it to sit for a few minutes, then it should wipe away easily. Now, you can use hair conditioner to make that new wool sweater less itchy. Just soak it in lukewarm water with a couple of tablespoons of conditioner and leave it for 15 minutes. Then just dry it and your sweater will be much softer. An odor on your fingers can be removed with some minty toothpaste. Rub them together with toothpaste, then rinse them clean. It'll help get rid of the odor and act as a light scrub, too. Now, before you throw out those old sneakers, arm yourself with an old toothbrush and a little toothpaste. Work the paste into the dirty spots and leave it for at least 10 minutes. Wipe it off with a damp cloth and repeat if it didn't do it right the first time. Be careful with color toothpaste, it may leave stains. Washing your clothes on a low heat, or even better, a cold wash, will make them last twice as long. Drying them on the line, if possible, will also make the material last longer than if you used a dryer. Metal zippers are very durable, but they'll snag more than other kinds of zippers. Just gently rub a bar of soap over the teeth of both sides of the zipper. The residue will help lubricate it, making it easier to slide open and closed. When you can't squeeze any more toothpaste out of your tube, just cut the end off. This will allow you to get what's left inside onto your toothbrush in a pinch. If there's enough for more than one use, place it in a plastic bag for later. Freezing candles before use can make them burn a lot slower. This will cool the wax right down and extend its melting time. A pack of cotton pads has those strings on it so that we can hang it on some hook or holder. And no, there's no need to untighten and tighten the pack again. Look at the bottom of the pack. It has a perforated line. Tear along it, and now you're good to pull out a cotton pad. If you've ever tasted a Nintendo cartridge, you'll confirm that, yes, they taste revolting, leaving a sour, bitterish aftertaste in your mouth. They're covered with denatonium benzoate, 
one of the most disgusting flavors known. Actually, this taste is kind of a hidden function. It prevents people from swallowing those cartridges. Headrests in a car are about comfort, and detachable headrests are about safety. If you pull the headrest out of the seat, you'll see two bars, which are quite sturdy. If you ever get locked or trapped in a car, you can get out of there smashing the window with these bars. Rough edges on the dimes aren't just about design. The coins used to be made of precious metals to show their real value. People would shave off the edges, spending the shaven coins with the same value, and melt the edges to new coins. To avoid it, minters added that pattern so people could tell if someone cut that coin before. That black grate on a microwave isn't just some fancy decoration. It's called a Faraday shield, and it prevents the rays from escaping the microwave. It also speeds up the heating, so you could enjoy yesterday's leftovers faster. A triple handle on a jerry can is there to make it easier for two people to carry it and distribute the fuel evenly. Gas cans often have a second hole that actually needs to be uncapped, too, before you pour the gas. The air passage will prevent it from pouring out, so no more fuel waste. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the